In this video, I'm going to cover Lewis acids and bases, hard and soft acids and bases, and the acidity of oxides. So a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor, and a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. So we can see here in this graphic that here's the Lewis acid, and here's the Lewis base. A Lewis base has a pair of electrons, because the Lewis base is an electron pair donor, and it donates that pair of electrons to the Lewis acid which accepts the pair of electrons. And in the process of donating and accepting electrons, a bond is formed. Um, and this bond is called a coordinate bond, and we'll talk more about that later. So generally, Lewis acid reacts with a Lewis base to form an adduct. And so here's a, a more specific example where we have a Lewis base um, a fluoride ion, which in this case has four pairs of electrons, but it's only going to use one pair of electrons to donate to the Lewis acid, which is in this case boron. So the reason that the boron is the Lewis acid in this, uh, in this compound is because boron is electron deficient. So remember that um, in that second shell of electrons, there's room for eight electrons. So that's the basis of the octet rule that uh, we've, we heard about earlier. And so in this compound, and in compounds with boron in general, we only have two, four, six electrons. And so um, this compound, we, we say, is electron deficient because it is capable of holding two more electrons. It only has six, and it has room for eight. So it uh, has room for two more. It's electron deficient, and the Lewis base can donate two electrons to the Lewis acid and form that fourth bond. And now you can see that boron in the, in the acid base adduct has two, four, six, eight electrons, and now it conforms to the octet rule. Um, so uh, this kind of reaction is very similar to what we saw with a Bronsted base and a Bronsted acid. Although, of course, a Bronsted acid is just H+. So the only thing that's accepting the electrons when we look at Bronsted acids is an H+. But when we look at Lewis acids, there's a, a far larger range of compounds that can act as Lewis acids in the same kind of sense that if we put H plus here, a base would be donating its electrons to H plus. So that's why we call these acid-base reactions, because the, it, the general mechanism is the same, but the compounds that are involved are slightly different. So um, to talk about hard and soft acids and bases, we have to talk about polarizability. So polarizability is defined as a species uh, that can, is polarizable if its electron cloud can be distorted by nearby ions and or dipoles. So here's a neutral compound or a neutral atom. And uh, when there's an ion nearby, the, uh, the compound can react in such a way to move its electron cloud toward, in this case, a positive ion or away from a negative ion. So a compound that's, uh, or a particle, could be an atom too, a, a molecule or an atom, that's capable of kind of distorting its electron cloud, moving it towards positive charges or away from elect uh, negative charges, we call that polarizable. And so here's another graphic to kind of show exactly what we're talking about. So um, if we look at a chloride ion, it is polarizable. And um, if there's a plus charge nearby, it can, you know, its cloud would generally be a sphere. And in this case, it's being pulled slightly towards that plus ion. If it's a two plus charge, the polarizability is greater. And if it's a three plus charge, the polarizability is greater still. So um, if we look at the uh, polarizability in general, we can see that that means that a chloride ion can move its electron cloud generally toward a positive charge, or any, any anion, anything, could move its electron cloud toward a positive charge or away from a negative charge. Its, um, its electron cloud is kind of loosely held to the nucleus. So uh, we can see over here that when we compare F minus and Cl minus and Br minus, um, all uh, next to the same ion, F minus is not particularly polarizable. So you can see, sure, there's maybe a little 
a little bit of a bump here in response to the aluminum 3 plus ion. But for the most part, its electron shell does not change shape very much when it's next to positive or negative charges. It's fairly spherical the whole time. The chloride ion, on the other hand, is more polarizable um, because it's bigger and the electrons in its valence shell, the electrons in the outermost shell, are held more loosely than those in the fluoride ion. And finally, bromide is even bigger, it has even more shells of electrons, and the, the shell of electrons that's on the outside experiences uh, shielding from the shells of electrons that are on the inside. And so the shell, the valence shell and the bromide ion, the biggest of all with the most electrons, is the most polarizable. Um, the electrons in the outermost shell are very loosely held. So in terms of acids and bases, um, we generally can say that uh, put acids and bases into two categories, hard and soft. Hard acids and bases are those that are not polarizable, and soft acids and bases are those that are polarizable. So um, if we look at this series here, F- is has the same charge as Cl- minus and Br- minus, a minus one charge. Um, and it's a base, it has a pair of electrons, in fact it has four pairs of electrons, just like chloride and just like bromide, and so it can donate a pair of electrons and it can act as a base in the same capacity that chloride and bromide have to be bases. They all have kind of the same charge and the same electrons. But F is not polarizable because it has um, only two shells of electrons, and the electrons uh, in that second shell are very tightly held to the nucleus so they don't um, they don't distort very much in the presence of a positive charge so since F minus is not polarizable we would say that it's a hard base whereas Br minus on the other hand since it has four shells of electrons and the electrons in the fourth shell experience shielding from those in the third shell and the second shell and the first shell then they're not as, high, as tightly held to the nucleus and therefore they are more polarizable. They will distort in the presence of a positive charge. So because bromide has uh, these polarizable electrons, we call it a soft base. So we can see here that um, in terms of acids, hard acids have a small radius, they're smaller, and that makes sense because if they're smaller they have fewer shells of electrons and fewer shells of electrons have less shielding and so the electrons are held more tightly to the nucleus. Um, they tend to have a high positive charge uh, which means again just that they are missing more electrons from their, from their outermost shell and the more electrons they're missing the greater the imbalance between positive charge and negative charge which causes those remaining electrons to be particularly tightly held and not able to distort. And therefore, they're not polarizable. And um, on conversely, we'd say about soft acids that they're bigger, larger radius, therefore more shells of electrons, more shielding, the outermost most shells are more loosely held. They generally have a low positive charge or a partial only even maybe just a partial positive charge um, which is to say that most of the electrons are in the atom or the nuke or the molecule um, and there's not as great an imbalance between positive and negative charge so that those electrons may be held a little bit less tightly and therefore they're polarizable they can be kind of shifted around in the presence of positive and negative charge so some examples of hard acids. These are the small ones. Um, H plus, obviously very small. Uh, sodium plus is small. Potassium is small. Magnesium is small. <clears throat> Aluminum is pretty small too. These are all in the first, second, and even some in, in the third row. We would consider most of those to be small. So having a small radius, we would say that they're hard. Even though aluminum 3 plus has a high charge, it would still be considered small because it's in the third row. But things that are in the fourth row, elements that are in the fourth row and beyond, we would generally consider to have a large radius. So then we get into things like scandium, 
um, thallium, uh, zirconium, and then even molecular species like uh, boron trifluoride. So when species are larger, they generally, when they're hard, they tend to have larger charges, three plus, four plus, four plus. And the soft ones here, again, we don't see these generally until we get to the fourth row of the periodic table and, and below, but then we get species like copper and silver, and um, here's thallium again, or thallium, and thallium one plus versus four plus, you can see it's the same element, and when it only has a one plus charge, we would consider it soft because the uh, ratio of protons to electrons is uh, less imbalanced and therefore those electrons are probably a, a, a bit more loosely held. But here in 4 plus there are so many electrons that have been removed that the remaining electrons are, are very tightly held to the nucleus. Um, and even maybe when we get up to 3 plus that is considered still to be considered a soft acid. Uh, and here the difference between boron trifluoride and borane, which is BH3, we can see that, um, remember, F is a very electronegative element. So in a bond between B and F, the F is taking most of the electrons away from B. So in BF3, this uh, boron, is, uh, most of its electrons have been pulled away by the fluorines. Therefore, it, it, we can say that it kind of has a high charge, right? Because if it, most of its electrons have been stripped away, even though they're covalent bonds, um, it has a high oxidation state nonetheless, and so it kind of is similar to having a high charge in that the remaining electrons are very tightly held. Whereas in BH3, the H's are not as electronegative as the F, and so those uh, electrons that boron brought into the covalent bonds are not being pulled away as much by the H's as they were by the F's. Therefore, the B has more electrons and if it has more electrons, those that are remaining uh, can are, are potentially held a little bit less tightly, or more polarizable. So um, small acids tend to be hard, and small bases tend to be hard. Um, high positive charge for hard acids, high electronegativity for hard bases, and um, hard acids are not polarizable and hard bases are not polarizable. So the, the hard aspect of the acids and bases is pretty much the same. Uh, we just kind of have flipped their charge, right? Acids are, have positive charges or high positive oxidation states and bases have negative charges or negative oxidation states. So <clears throat> we can see that water would be considered a hard base. The, the electrons on the oxygen are not very polarizable. Same thing with OH minus, not very polarizable. We already saw F minus, those electrons are not polarizable. Even Cl minus, which are more polarizable than F minus, we would still consider that to be a hard base um, because they're not nearly as polarizable as Br minus or even I minus, which is the most polarizable of the halogens. Um, and here again, ROH, this is just R is a carbon-containing group. So carbon bonded to oxygen, oxygen here being the base, the basic atom, NH3, nitrogen being the basic atom, CO3, oxygen being the basic atom, PO4, oxygen. So we can see here that when a base has oxygen in it, it's considered a hard base, oxygen or nitrogen, and these smaller halogens. Um, and conversely, when a base has some of the bigger atoms, sulfur, which is right below oxygen, it's a bigger, kind of a bigger version of oxygen, right? Right below in the same family. Um, and Br minus and I minus are both halogens, so below F minus and Cl minus. As they get bigger, they get more polarizable and therefore they become softer. So hard acids tend to react more strongly with hard bases, and soft acids tend to react more strongly with soft bases. In an equilibrium problem, we can determine which side is favored by determining which side has soft, soft, and hard, hard pairs, um, as opposed to the side where a soft base is paired with a hard acid and vice versa. So if we look at this equilibrium down here, we can see that there are some things that we've already identified as being acids and bases or and hard or soft. So BF3 looks familiar. 
NH3 looks familiar. So remember BF3, the reason that we would consider this to be um, an acid, it's a Lewis acid, is because the boron is electron deficient. So remember, um, generally compounds have eight electrons in the second, in the uh, second and third row, they tend to have eight electrons. So boron only has six electrons because it has two, four, six. It has bonds in each of these BF, it has electrons in each of these BF bonds, and boron does not have a lone pair. So since boron only has six electrons, that means it has room for two more. So since it can accept a pair of electrons, boron is considered a Lewis acid. So here we have this Lewis acid paired with this, which we would then assume must be a Lewis base. If this is our acid, this must be our base. And then we have this pairing over here. And of this pairing, we should recognize NH3. We saw that on the last slide too, and NH3 is a hard base. So generally bases have oxygen atoms or nitrogen atoms, and uh, or at least these hard ones do. And hard bases are small, atoms and oxygen and nitrogen are small and they have high electronegativity. So um, NH3 is a hard base and we said BF3 is an acid and because those F's are removing its electrons it has a high oxidation state. So it's a hard acid. Hard acid, hard base. And now let's look at these other pairs. This is AS and uh, gallium. And so if we look at our periodic table here, astatine is, uh, or excuse me, arsenic is down here, two below nitrogen. So if we'd consider nitrogen and oxygen to be hard bases because they're small and high electronegativity, then uh, arsenic would be considered to be much bigger than nitrogen, and so it would be softer than nitrogen. And aluminum, we said we consider to be a hard acid, even though it has a three plus charge because it it's, uh, tends to be smaller. Gallium is much bigger than aluminum. It has um, more than twice as many protons. And so gallium uh, would be considered to be a soft acid. Hard acid, aluminum, soft acid, gallium. Hard base, nitrogen, soft base, arsenic. So gallium, we would, be, we would consider to be a soft acid, and arsenic, we would consider to be a soft base. So when we look at these pairings, we have hard acid, soft base, and we have hard base, soft acid. So they're, they're, this side of the equilibrium has them mixed up. The si we said here that hard acids react more strongly with hard bases. So here, BF3, we have said that's a hard acid, and NH3 is a hard base. So on this side, I have a pairing that has hard acid, hard base. Hard likes to pair with hard. And so this is a favorable pairing. And here I have gallium and arsenic. This is a big atom, big atom, soft acid, soft base. So this is a favorable pairing. So on this side of the equilibrium, the pairing is more favorable. And on this side of the equilibrium, the pairing is less favorable. So the equilibrium lies on this side. So it lies to the right in this equation. So problems like this require um, identifying which of them are acids and bases, and then further identifying whether they're hard acids or soft acids, and hard bases or soft bases. Okay, let's look at the acidity and basis, uh, basicity of salts. So we've looked at this before in a previous chapter. And what we saw there was that most cations are neutral, like sodium and potassium and magnesium and calcium. And most of these cations, especially from the main, uh, the first two groups, alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, they're neutral cations. But ions that have a large positive charge, generally three plus or above, they tend to act as acids in water. And the reason they do this, and um, that's, you know, generally we say an acid is H plus. But an acid can also be Al3+. Aluminum 3 plus can increase, or excuse me, decrease the pH of water in the same way that H plus is. If I add H plus to water, the pH goes down. If I add Al3 plus to water, the pH goes down.
even though there's no H plus in what I'm adding, it's just aluminum three plus. So the reason that aluminum causes the pH to go down is because aluminum can create a coordination compound, a complex ion with molecules of water. So six molecules of water crowd around aluminum and they actually make these covalent bonds that are called coordination bonds to the aluminum ion, six of them do, and this geometry here is called octahedral. We've seen this before. It's kind of like the X, Y, and Z coordinate system, a series of perpendicular lines. Um, and so when this complex ion is created, I have these oxygen atoms here that have three, uh, that have three bonds to them. And so that what that means is that this third bond that the water molecule is making is kind of making these two bonds weaker the bonds that the oxygen oh bonds have become weaker because oxygen is also bonded to aluminum and so what that means is that another water molecule that's not part of the complex can get nearby and when it gets next to one of these h pluses it can kind of take it away so it kind of showed it leaving from this one but it, you know, imagine it had come from this one, which was right next to this water molecule. It went pop, and one of these H's came over here because these bonds were weakened. The OH bonds were weakened because the O is also bonded to the aluminum here. And so the aluminum itself did not bring any H plus into the solution, but because the aluminum is in solution, I suddenly have H3O plus, where there was no H3O plus before. And remember, H3O plus is the same as H plus, and that's like we would consider that to be an acid, and that decreases the pH of a solution. So I add H plus to a solution, I make H3O plus. If I add Al3 plus to a solution, I make H3O plus in this more roundabout manner, but the result is the same that I get H3O plus, which is more acid, so the pH goes down. So again, cations, most of them are neutral. But if they have a large positive charge, then they're acidic. Anions, most anions are basic. And we would say almost anything with a negative charge is basic to some extent. Except the conjugate bases of strong acids are not basic, they're neutral. So those are things like, remember, Cl minus and Br minus and I minus and nitrate and sulfate and chlorate. Um, the anions that come from the strong acids, they are neutral, they're not basic. And there's only six of them. But anything else that has a negative charge is basic to some extent. So when we're considering oxides, an oxide is an anion, it's O2 minus. We've seen OH minus before. OH minus is called hydroxide. OH minus and oxide are similar. Um, it's just that OH minus has one H and O2 minus has zero H's. And so we can look at this series where O2 minus comes from and it comes, it comes from water. We can see that H2 O is neutral. If it loses one H plus, then we're left with OH minus. And if OH minus loses another H plus, then we're left with O2 minus. So this is oxide. And this is hydroxide. So oxide, O2 minus, um, is very basic. We consider hydroxide to be a strong base. We even consider water to be a weak base. Water is a weak base. OH minus, hydroxide is a strong base. O2 minus is a very strong base. So oxide is very basic. So um, when we're thinking about uh, the the term oxide generally refers to this anion O2 minus. But oxides, there's a group of compounds that we call oxides, and oxides can actually be ionic or covalent. So when I'm talking about an ionic oxide, I'm talking about something that has the oxide anion in it. And so remember that ionic compounds are metal plus nonmetal. 
So something that's ionic starts with a metal. So aluminum, for example, being a metal, Al2O3, aluminum oxide, this is an ionic compound because it goes metal, non-metal. And I know that what ionic compounds do is when I put them in water, they dissolve, they dissociate. And what that means is that the aluminum and the oxygen separate. So the aluminum is really Al3+, plus, and the oxygen is really O2-, minus in these ionic compounds with oxygen, these oxides. But there's also a class of oxide compounds that are covalent. And remember the main difference, I know it's been a while since we've seen this, but the main difference between ionic and covalent compounds is that ionic goes metal and nonmetal, and covalent is nonmetal and nonmetal. Ionic in a metal and a nonmetal, the metal is a cation, and the nonmetal is an anion. So plus and minus are stuck together with an ionic bond. But in a covalent compound, nonmetal and nonmetal, they share the electrons like a tug of war. So since they're sharing the electrons and neither side is plus or minus, um, there is no ionic bond. And that's called a covalent bond. So this is a sharing of electrons. So B is a nonmetal boron. Oxygen is a nonmetal. So B and O do not have pluses and minuses. They share the electrons. They, it does not dissociate when I put it in water. The B's and the O's stick together. So this is called an oxide, the ionic version, and it contains an oxide anion. This covalent compound is also called an oxide, even though it does not contain an oxide anion. The covalent compound is not going to dissociate, and so it's not going to create O2 minus. B2O3 does not contain O2 minus in it. It does not contain an oxide anion. These three O's are different. And here we can see that. This is what aluminum oxide looks like. Al2O3 has two Al3 pluses for a total charge of six plus, and three O2 minuses for a total charge of six minus. Six plus and six minus cancel out, and the ionic bond is between the pluses and the minuses here. In this covalent compound, since they're both nonmetals, there is no plus and minus. They are bonded together by covalent bonds. And remember, these covalent bonds actually have some kind of geometry. So they're not just moving about um, stuck together only by their, plus and their, their positive and negative charge. They are stuck in a very specific shape because of the way that they share electrons. And those electrons are sitting in very specific orbitals. So they have to be arranged in these very specific shapes in order to share electrons. So there are oxide ions in ionic oxides. There are no oxide ions in covalent oxides. So again, the oxide anion, O2 minus, is very basic. Cations are generally either neutral or if they have a high charge, they're acidic. So ionic oxides will always contain oxide and they will also always contain a cation. So cations will, are either neutral or acidic. So since I all, in, in an ionic oxide, I always have an oxide. That's always what the anion is. That's why I call it an oxide. And the oxide is always very basic then that means that one half of my ionic oxide is always basic. I can't change that. That's the nature of an oxide. But the other half, the cation half of an ionic oxide, can either be neutral or it can be acidic if the charge is very high. So if we put those together, I have a cation that's neutral. I have an anion that's basic. That means the overall nature of my compound is basic. If I have a cation that's acidic and I have an anion that's basic, then the nature of that compound that's created from this combination is acidic and basic, which is called amphoteric. It's both. It's acidic and basic. So when I'm talking about ionic oxides, if I've identified that my compound is an oxide, and then I have further identified that my compound is ionic by seeing if it starts with a metal or not, then there are two possibilities for the acidity and basicity of the compound it creates. 
there are the compound is either totally basic because the oxide is always basic and the cation doesn't change the pH at all, it's neutral, or my ionic oxide is amphoteric because the oxide is always basic and the cation in this case happens to be one that is also acidic. So it's both. So these are the two possibilities that I have if I have identified my oxide as being ionic, basic or amphoteric. I cannot have an ionic oxide that is acidic, because, that is acidic only, because the oxide half is always basic. And I cannot have an uh, uh, ionic oxide that is neutral, because the oxide is always basic. So part of my compound must be basic because of this very basic oxide anion. If I look at the acidity and basicity of covalent oxides, those that have a nonmetal first, and, uh, or excuse me, two nonmetals, a nonmetal and then a nonmetal, the oxygen atom in the covalent atom, um, oxides is not basic, it's neutral. So the oxygen atom in ionic oxides is always basic, but the oxygen atom in covalent oxides is not basic. So the first step when you're trying to sort these out and say is this compound acidic or is this compound basic or is this compound neutral or is this compound amphoteric? The first step is identifying whether the compound is ionic or covalent because there's a different set of rules depending on whether it's ionic or covalent. You're going to look at that oxygen in a different way. So in covalent compounds, the oxygen atom is not basic, it's neutral. And the first nonmetal atom, the, the one that's not oxygen, it can either be neutral or it can be acidic. So the, when I'm looking at a covalent compound, um, nonmetal atoms that have a low oxidation number are generally neutral. So if they have a, an oxidation number of zero or plus one or plus two, I can say that that nonmetal, like if it's a carbon, if I'm looking at um, carbon monoxide, for example, C O. Yeah, this one is minus and this is plus. So here's my Lewis structure for carbon monoxide. Remember that the um, oxidation number of carbon is minus two. Therefore, the oxidation number of carbon of carbon is plus two. I think I said carbon. The oxidation number of oxygen is minus two. The oxidation number of carbon is therefore plus two. So um, oxygen is neutral in this oxide and carbon having a zero or plus one or plus two charge is also neutral. So this is neutral and this is neutral. Therefore neutral plus neutral the compound is neutral is a neutral oxide, carbon monoxide. Uh, but if I look at a different compound, for example, carbon dioxide, then in carbon dioxide, this oxygen is minus 2, and this oxygen is minus 2. Therefore, this carbon, since this is a neutral compound, this carbon must be plus 4. So then I have neutral oxygen, neutral oxygen, but the carbon is acidic because nonmetal atoms that have a high oxidation number, plus 3, plus 4, and so on, are acidic. Carbon is plus 4, therefore it's acidic. So neutral plus acidic plus neutral equals acidic. This is an acidic oxide because the carbon has a high oxidation number. So what about boron? What is the oxidation number of boron here? We have 2 minus 2 minus 2 minus. So that's a total 6 minus. And I have two boron atoms, so I'm dividing that 6 minus by 2 equals 3, right? I guess it would be just taking the total amount of charge, but absolute, absolute value here. So it should just be positive 3, right? Because I have to balance that negative charge, plus 3 and plus 3. 
So I have 2, 4, 6 negative charge, plus 3, plus 3, plus 6 neg uh, positive charge. So the oxidation number on boron is plus 3, therefore it's acidic. Neutral, acidic, acidic. So this whole compound is therefore acidic. So when, I'm, when I've identified my oxide as being covalent, made of two nonmetals, my possibilities are that it is either acidic or it is neutral. Those are the only two possibilities if I have identified my compound as being covalent. So again, there are four possibilities when I'm trying to determine what uh, the acidity or basicity of any oxide. If it's covalent, the, cho the two choices are neutral or acidic. And if it's ionic, the two choices are basic or amphoteric. So my four choices are acidic or basic, amphoteric or neutral. And the way that I get there is by determining whether it's ionic or whether it's covalent.